This is a production of WTVI PBS Charlotte. Just ahead on Carolina Impact, how do those cars go so fast on the speedway? Well, we'll take you to a school where students train to make it all happen. Plus, these small business owners are making their dreams a reality in a unique way. Coming up, why the 7th Street Public Market is becoming a community favorite. And we'll find out why Charlotte is one of the top spots for touring Broadway shows. Stay tuned. Carolina Impact starts right now. WTBI PBS Charlotte presents Carolina Impact, covering the issues, people, and places that impact you. This is Carolina Impact. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTBI PBS Charlotte and by... The Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. Good evening, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Amy Burkett. The motorsports industry helps drive the Charlotte region's economy. Dozens of race car teams from the NASCAR Sprint Cup, Nationwide, and Camping World Truck Series are headquartered right here. But before the drivers rev up their engines, these teams need trained automotive technicians to design, build, and repair them. Recently, we went to a unique school that combines the Universal Technical Institute automotive training and NASCAR technologies into one program. As Carolina Impact's Iredell County correspondent, Charu Kamaria explains, some students earning a vocational degree from here are in the fast lane to a bright future. Heather Holcomb came to Universal Technical Institute after getting a four-year degree in finance and accounting, but she quickly realized that's not what she wanted to do. This isn't school to me. I've been to school before, and I dreaded every day going. I'm here every day. I wake up on time. I'm here on time. The 23-year-old has been enrolled at UTI's Mooresville campus for the last seven months. There are 11 campuses like this one across the country, but this is the only one endorsed by NASCAR. If you come to school here, it doesn't mean you're going to be Jeff Gordon's tire changer. However, when Kyle Busch comes in the pits in his uh, M&M Toyota, both of his tire changers graduated from NASCAR Tech. Uh, when Tony Stewart makes a pit stop, his tire changer, tire carrier, gas man, all graduated from here. UTI trains roughly 1,000 students a year. A basic diploma here costs about $32,000. The goal is to have students earning that their first year out in the workforce. Their success is our success or you know, makes you feel good about what you're doing. Instructors here believe it's attainable. It's not uncommon to see UTI grads making $75,000 to $100,000 annually five years after graduation because these are jobs that are in demand. There's not enough students, there's not enough people learning trades in our country to fill these jobs. Because of that immense need, companies actually provide tools to train the next generation of automotive technicians. They need the technicians. Ford Motor Company is in every one of our campuses. They have a shortage of technicians. Uh, Nissan as well, um, BMW, Mercedes, Porsche, all of these companies support UTI. The excitement of the race world is what attracted New Jersey native Brandon Trano to UTI. This 14 is definitely, definitely too tight. Even as a young child, he knew that's where his passion was. Hopefully I can make it into a very well-known NASCAR team. I mean, even a lower level team would be ideal. Just being in the industry is what I want to do. In addition to learning how to be an automotive mechanic, UTI trains students on how to look work ready and how to deal with customers and others they'll encounter in their professional careers. And because the industry changes so rapidly, graduates can come back at any time to update their skills for free. Shortage of technicians in the automotive field uh, People need jobs, uh, and you need your car worked on. They're a lot more complicated when I, than when I was helping my dad build Continental engines for quarter midgets in 1957, 1958. The racing world brings many to UTI. The $6 billion motorsports industry has a huge impact on the region and on the school. 
Located near the school is Penske Racing with uh, 40 graduates working there. Roush Yates Racing Engines. They've hired over 70 graduates from us. And then there's the businesses that support motorsports in North Carolina. There's radiator companies, uh, roll bar padding, uh, window companies, tire companies. All of these companies in North Carolina hire our graduates. UTI grads who end up working in NASCAR can help win races in a multitude of ways. And if they're good, they can easily earn a six-figure salary. We're going to send this out and have a bunch of machine work done. NASCAR is a good fit for many students who take Doug Wolf's Advanced Engines courses. Students get to practice their new skills in real-world scenarios. We build engines that actually go out and are raced in the k and East series. This will take you wherever you want to go. And honestly, you know, I had so many doubts coming into the school because I was a female. Um, but actually being at this school and giving my 100%, it showed me that actually females can make it a lot further than they think they can. Holcomb will graduate next April, and along the way, she's learning new skills that she had no idea she'd be good at. And when they found out that I was really good with my hands, they moved me over to fabricating and then taught me how to weld, and I just kind of blew it out of the water, and I've been doing it ever since. She says the world is hers for the taking, whether she ends up working for a team. I have an internship at a race shop, and I got that just through great opportunities through the school. Um, I started out doing the rear end suspension brakes and um, now I'm over fabricating and welding. Or for herself, running her own garage designing engines of the future. For Carolina Impact, I'm Charu Kamari, you're reporting. Thanks so much, Charu. Well, next, we're heading to 7th Street Public Market in Uptown Charlotte. But it also serves as a community gathering place and the launch pad for small business owners to introduce their products. Carolina Impact's Sarah Batista has more. Vanilla sugar latte. When James Yoder moved his business, not just coffee, into the 7th Street Public Market in Uptown Charlotte, the place was practically empty. I think it was us and Cloud9 were the first businesses in here, and there were some other like small pop-ups, so it was definitely slow going in the beginning. It took us, it took us a while. Is that for here, Brian? That was almost three years ago. Today, not just coffee is thriving. James says much of that success comes from the market's business model, designed to help entrepreneurs get their businesses off the ground. I think the shared overhead is obviously hugely beneficial. I think the space itself is really unique, having a public space. There's nothing else like it in Charlotte, really. There's the Atherton Mill Market, but as far as like spaces uptown, it's completely unique. You don't have to be a customer to, you know, hang out in here, um, people come into work. It's a great meeting place. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Well, it's counterculture coffee, so I definitely, like, that's the best thing for me, because I love organic coffee. And there aren't many places in Charlotte that serve it. I mean, there are a few, but not very many, so I think this is the best out of, like, the couple that there are. The market has been open for a little over two years, and already it's at capacity with 15 small businesses. Here you can find anything from fresh, locally grown produce to fresh cheese. Hey, James, how you doing? Good, Mike. How's it going, man? So how was As executive director of the 7th Street Public Market, Mike Ristano works with the owners of these small businesses to ensure they get the mentoring and consulting support needed to become successful. He compares the market to a low-tech incubator, but for food businesses. He says it's built to celebrate the food culture of North Carolina. A lot of them are very skilled at what they do. Uh, and now they're given the opportunity to try, try to exploit that. And uh, they try to do the very best they can. And I think the quality of what they do and the service and the professionalism that they inspire to makes them separate from the rest of the crowd. We chose this place because A, they have healthy alternatives. And it's just, it's, it offers a lot of different variety. You can get basically whatever you want, as well as like the soaps. They've already been over there looking at the soaps too. Of the businesses within the 7th Street Public Market also do business with more than 45 North Carolina farmers, organizations, or other food-related businesses, representing 30 North Carolina counties. It's really a, a, an exciting when you see how our, our tentacles are now spreading through the state as far as what we're trying to do for North Carolina agriculture. Uh, we've been in the market over two years now. Raymond Perillo runs Bonsai Fusion Sushi inside 7th Street Public Market. He says leasing shared space 
though releasing an entire building, has allowed him to cut down on expenses and keep from hiring extra staff. I love that it could be, it's, it's different from being in a restaurant where it's kind of the same kind of thing every day. I never know what's gonna happen here. I can meet just like the most interesting people, meet people from out of town, and at the same time, like you have the locals too that kind of balance that out. A combination of food, variety, and community, all in one central location. For Carolina Impact, I'm Sarah Batista reporting. Thanks so much, Sarah. Joining me now is Chris Hammonds, Director of Retail for Charlotte Center City Partners. Chris, nice to have you here. Thank you, thank you for having me. You know what, it's great to see that spot doing so well. And, but it employs a lot of folks too that we didn't hear about in it the did. story. It did, close to 100 people work there. So you have 16 vendors and close to 100 employees and it really has become a real destination for uptown. Well, you know, Uptown is such a destination. It's a beautiful city, and we've all lived in, in quite a few. But what is the challenge to bring retail well, to Uptown? Well, I, I think you have a couple of things. One is identifying space. Uh, if you look at Tryon Street, a lot of the space that would be prime for retail is actually occupied by other types of uses. Also, when we look at density and population, um, a lot of what drives retail are rooftops. So as we continue to build up our center city, specifically uptown, we'll see more retail interest over time. Because the more people we have living there, the more demand there'll be to make the businesses successful because nothing's worse than having a business start and go out of business. Right, I mean, that's the key. In this new role as director of retail, my, my role is to really go out there to identify those opportunities, but I wanna bring viable, sustainable retail to our downtown because you're right, I don't want a business to come here, a retailer to come here, and then after a year or two, they have no market or they're struggling to stay afloat. So all of us women who really do like to shop <laughs> and we're looking for maybe that, that big chain like a Macy's or something, it may be too large to put in our uptown. Right, when we look at what might work, we're actually out there right now talking to retail brokers that have been in the market for a long time. I'm not from Charlotte, but I'm from Chicago, so I've seen other concepts work, but we have to identify the right types of products that will work, the right types of retailers, and so that's why we're out actively not only developing a strategy and a vision, but also working with our existing brokers that are in the market, our owners that are here, and the public sector to identify the right strategy going forward. So let's talk about an area like South End. Lots of houses, lots of developments going up there, lots of condos. What would work something like that? Could you have something like a Blakeney Village, like those smaller types of shops, you know, a, a lifestyle center? Well, uh, to me, when I look at South End, it really is that eclectic area where you have a lot of the local retailers, independent shops that make it really cool and interesting. It has a personality when you go to South End. And then, so for, so for Uptown, what we really need to do is we need to identify those places where it will work try to find some, or, some of those organic uses that you can bring into an area that make it interesting and give it a personality because a lot of people say that Uptown is buttoned up, it's very corporate, and where can you find those small pockets where you can bring in really interesting retail so that it becomes a place that people want to come to because there's an experience. You've created a place in Uptown for people to shop. Okay, I love to shop. So what types of shops might I get in Uptown? Are we talking women's clothing or more shoes and accessories? What seems to maybe be the right fit? The, the biggest needs I think that we've identified are of course grocery. We have a very small Harris Teeter right now in Uptown so we know that we need more grocery in Uptown but we also need more soft goods apparel. So you're right, we need women's shoes, we need women's clothing, um, but we just need apparel in general. Cosmetics has been a huge need that I've heard from, from many women. So we will conduct a survey on our uptown to identify the right types of uses for the residents, for the employees that are here. But we also hear from the visitors that are coming to uptown looking for opportunities to shop and they're wondering, you know, this is supposed to be a big town, but how come there's no shopping available close to or within close proximity to the convention center? So the success that the city is having now, we've been attracting businesses just at a, what seems to be an astronomical rate. Mm -hmm. This is, and so they're building the housing, so this is the next step, but is it always the lag behind that retail? Well, I, I, I think it depends, and if you look at the history, I've been to other markets, so I've looked at Greenville, I've looked at my Charleston, as I mentioned, I was just in Chicago, so you have a long history of having older buildings that are in place, and so for us, we've kind of torn down some of the more historic buildings, and we've built these large office towers, and so I think we have to kind of go back to the drawing board and kind of look at this as like a blank slate. How can we bring in the types of uses that 
will create this retail environment that we're seeking, and that's the challenge right now. So I think we have to look at the future developments that are planned for Uptown. There are several office towers that are being proposed, but then we also have retail developments, or, or residential developments, I should say, that are uh, right now in process that will be built, and how can we serve those residents that will live in those projects? Chris, I want you to be successful because I want to come shop in Uptown. Well, I want you to shop in Uptown as well. So. so we thank you so much for your time and sharing it with us today. Thank you. Well, we're going to stay in Uptown Charlotte for our next story. One of the things I love most is watching live theater. I used to live 90 minutes from Broadway, but these days you don't have to travel to New York to enjoy great performances. Ten Broadway shows and several special attractions are headed to the Blumenthal Performing Arts Center this season. And theater here is big business. Did you know Charlotte is considered a top ten market? Some shows have had their highest box office sales right here in the Queen City. Recently, Carolina Impact's Jeff Reibenbark sat down with Tom Gabbard, the man some say is responsible for the Blumenthal's success. Before the curtain rises at Night Theater, Jeffrey Tom Gabbard never suffers show. from stage fright. I worry about ticket sales every day. He's been the president of Blumenthal Performing Arts for 11 years. Fortunately, I love what I do. I see typically in the range of 350 to 400 shows a year. Some of the best shows come to Charlotte thanks to Gabbard's connections with Broadway. I'm a voter for the Tony Awards and have been since 1997, which means I see every new Broadway show. Typically five to six shows a year, I'll organize an investment group that will essentially own 10% of a Broadway show. And that 10% gives us an opportunity then to shape the strategy for taking the show out on the road, selecting the entire touring team, and in the process making sure that Charlotte is given some preference in the booking of those shows. And since Charlotte is a big market for theater, many of the touring companies want to perform here. People here know the difference between good and bad. So, so we do you know, try to make sure that we're spot on with what the market is looking for. Just one look and I can hear a Classic shows like Mamma Mia have a way of connecting across generations. Whoa, whoa, Mama Mia. It's a show that mom grew up with and now mom has a chance to introduce it to her kids. Hello. Hello. While others, create a bit of controversy. If there is language or content that some might find objectionable, we try to communicate that in a, in a, in a totally straightforward, unapologetic way. The Book of Mormon definitely pushed the envelope. People had some trepidation about it because of the language, and we were thrilled that it ended up being a huge hit. Offering a wide array of performances, Gabbard says, is key to Blumenthal's success. Certainly, Broadway is the foundation that we build our schedule on, but there's a lot here. Uh, actually, the majority of performances are non-theatrical shows. Blumenthal Performing Arts also gives back to the community. We try to move in ways that will actually lift up and help other arts organizations. For instance, a few years ago, we created Carolina Ticks as a regional ticketing company. We devoted one of our theaters at Spirit Square year-round to use by local theater companies rent-free. Gabbard says having a strong arts community helps motivate and inspire children. Seeing talented performers, seeing a show that just turns them on, that can be the kind of thing that, that helps them to aim high. In, in their own personal lives. Theater also engages audiences to confront and discuss important social issues, as in the case of the show Next to Normal. That was about uh, a family where the mother suffered from schizophrenia. We played it here at the Knight Theater, and after every performance, we had a, a mental health professional that was there just to allow people to talk. So what's coming next season? We are really looking forward to an all new production of Phantom of the Opera. Cameron McIntosh, the British producer, has come up with, with an entirely new look, new feel to it. All right, you've been in the Charlotte area for over 10 years and you've been in theater management for 30 some years. Um, what will be your legacy? Hopefully my, my legacy is, is that we've made Blumenthal uh, an important part of this community, that, that we are a place where Charlotte comes together, that we're a place where people can enjoy the arts, but they can also enjoy a sense of community. From the Belk Theater with seating for 2100 
To the more modest Booth Playhouse, which seats 400 plus, the newest venue, Knight Theater, fills an important niche. It was strategically designed to be that mid-sized theater that would have a different experience from those other venues. But the stage is, is large enough that we could do really just about any Broadway show that we needed to. Whether by phone. Would you like to purchase? Or in person, each ticket sold is an opportunity to create a memorable experience. At just about any performance, there will be somebody that will remember that evening for the rest of their lives. So to know that we have set the stage to invite people here to have those experiences, to have something that they've looked forward to all week, all month, all year, uh, that is a tremendous honor. An honor Gabbard and the Blumenthal Performing Arts staff are working hard each day to ensure anyone sitting out here stands with applause as the final curtain falls. For Carolina Impact, I'm Jeff Reibenbark reporting. Thanks so much, Jeff. Well, lots of shows are coming in the next few months. In November, Rogers and Hammerstein's Cinderella, followed by Sister Act here for one night only in December, and the smash hit musical Newsies is coming in January. For complete details, you can check out the link on our website at pbscharlotte.org. Well, from artists who perform on stage to, well, an artist who creates art in his backyard. The Huntersville man you're about to meet started his career in welding, making repairs on farm equipment. As senior producer Rick Fitz shows us, artist Benny Reeder creates metal sculptures using discarded materials that reflect his regional southern heritage. I just had to itch to make something one day, and I had to make some weird something up, you know. I've been doing that for a while now. I've been doing that ever since uh, OJ got in trouble. Yeah, I make my living doing uh, repair work on trailers and, and do a lot of sell a lot of artwork also. The uh, them blue tanks, I take them and cut them and make sunflowers out of them like this one, which is uh, pretty easy to do. I sell a lot of these. The worse, the different than this, the more complicated this, you know. And I want something somebody else has got, you know. That's a 65 Chevrolet truck. Been working on it going on probably five years. It's got a 425 Cadillac engine in it, board 30 over. It's got cam headers. It's just what I call a uh, rat rod truck. It's got a whole kind of dead stuff on it. My wife don't like it because it's got the dead stuff on it. Eight foot camper bed on the back with a six foot porch on the back. I got my leg steel right here now. This most less for looks, and then it don't work, so I got a wooden bottom in it. It can't work. It could be made to work, but I ain't making it work. Then you get John Law will be over here then. It's a barbecue grill. You got to have a grill to go on your truck. That many bites got to go on my rat rod out there. To, when you get when you go into your car shows, you got to have something to get around the car show on. And I got to be cut and modified and stretched and put a big old engine in there. A little different. Can't be stopped, gotta be out something odd. That's my office door. Somebody's gonna throw the pepper machine away. So wait a minute, I'm building a new office. I'm need me a door. See that? You put a door like it, ain't nobody know where your office is. Yeah, I like to do stuff different. A lot of times you get a pile of junk laying there. You can uh, just look at it pretty well, tell what you can make out of it. You know, just, just go through your head and just think about it. That's my problem, I got too many ideas. It's a dinosaur, it's about 30 feet long, and it's made out of old shopping carts. I cut them up, welded them together, and made them. The motorcycle was one they copied it out of the uh, Batman movie. They rode in the Batman. It's an old direction, an old chair, but they got broke. I just put it on them wheels, made it look like an old lawnmower chair. Bottom down, that's made out of an old propane tank. Center part's made out of an uh, old well tank. It's made out of 74-year tags, license plates, and all they did was bolt it together with old quarter-inch bolts and made it up. PT-109, this, this is no airplane I made up. This part right in here is no washing machine. Yeah, and this part right here is no part of an old hair dryer. That's a charcoal grill there. You guy sitting in here like he's driving it, and then you got your cell phone. It, it's, it's been in three weddings. 
fun is making it and finding the parts to make it. You got to get out and hustle up a lot of parts trying to make a lot of stuff. Just get out there and do it. You know, you ain't going to learn nothing until you do it. If you mess up, do it again. You ain't got one life. Do the best you can with what you got. Thanks, Rick. Benny's yard art is open to the public. You'll see some of his sculptures as you drive by. He's located off I-77, exit 23 at 9415 Gilead Road. Well, remember, you can find all the links we've mentioned during the show on our Carolina Impact page at pbscharlotte.org. Be sure to friend us on Facebook at WTVI Charlotte for a chance to win monthly prizes. And you can friend me at Amy Burkett. Our show's all about the issues, people, and places that impact you. So we need your help to find great segments for future shows. Please send us your story ideas to carolinaimpact at wtvi.org. From the entire team here at PBS Charlotte, thanks so much for joining us, and we hope to see you back here again next time. Good night. Funding for Carolina Impact is provided by the members of WTVI PBS Charlotte and by... The Philip L. Van Every Foundation is pleased to support our region's arts organizations and artists with profiles and feature stories on Carolina Impact. Production of WTVI PBS Charlotte.